West Hemisphere to experience human settlement, the West is now the home of every racial group on the planet. Since the arrival of Columbus in 1492, the population of the Americas, including Caribbean nations, has climbed from less than 100 million people, which is a highly speculative estimate, to over 880 million folks. That's almost a billion. However, in less than 50 years, the population will grow well over 1 billion. While the Americas are the homes of all races of people, there are special patterns among them. There are also patterns of economic development that are quite contrastive. Indeed, the range per capita GDPs among American countries is more than $40,000 per year. That's per person. However, this rather large range is subsidized heavily by the United States, which is borrowing significant sums of money from China and Japan. In other words, the real range is closer to $35,000, which is still an impressive figure. On the other hand, and at the other end of the spectrum, is Haiti. Its per capita GDP of $1,300 places it among the poorest countries in the world. In less than 30 years, this population density will match or exceed a number of cities in the United States. Mexico will reach a population of over 200 million people by 2060. Given the exodus of people from that country as well as from Haiti, it's clear that their carrying capacities have been exceeded. One can only imagine the plight of Mexican and Haitian peoples if they had twice as many mouths to feed. However, if their current fertility rates spread with them to other places, those places too will become overpopulated. Something to think about. Carrying capacities will also be exceeded in other Latin American countries. Situated between Cuba and Puerto Rico, the island of Hispaniola is one of the most densely populated islands in the Americas. Two sovereign countries share the island. We've already mentioned Haiti. It occupies the western reaches of the island, while the Dominican Republic governs the eastern portion. As mentioned above, Haiti's population density, which is already 839 people per square mile, about like Lexington, Kentucky's, by the way, that's also 324 people per square kilometer for those of you who run a metric system, it will double to 1,678 people per square mile or 648 people per square kilometer in just 28 years. Thirteen years later, the Dominican Republic, too, will reach 1,000 people per square mile. That's a big threshold. These countries sit astride an earthquake zone, so at some point in the future, a strong quake will strike the island. Because of its much denser human population, the loss of life on Hispaniola will be catastrophic. The loss of life could be reduced substantially by adopting the successful construction designs used by the Japanese and people in California. As a case in point, the substantial loss of life resulting from the March 2011 earthquake in Japan was caused mostly by tsunamis inundating low-lying coastal cities. The shaking and collapsing of homes and businesses caused comparatively fewer deaths. While the effect of overpopulation is not readily apparent to most people, the factors associated with it are nevertheless in place. There are 13 countries in which the doubling time is less than 50 years. Of those 13, only Mexico and Panama boast per capita GDPs greater than $10,000 per year. On the other hand, Guatemala and El Salvador are more typical of Central American countries. In just 31 years, there will be 622 Guatemalans crammed into one square mile. Less than three-fourths of the population of Guatemala can read, so its workforce will be well-suited to low-wage manufacturing jobs. Without external investments to expand the country's manufacturing economy, however, more of the local rainforest will be depleted for cultivation to feed its population. The situation is perhaps even more precarious in El Salvador. In just 36 years, that country will have more than 1,600 people per square mile. Again, without external investments in the country's meager manufacturing economy, families will have little choice but to clear more land to make way for intensive agriculture. Lands once occupied by rainforests are not well suited to commercial agriculture due to the processes of leaching and laterization. As rainfall percolates down through soil horizons, 
Root systems of native plant species keep nutrients and moisture near the ground surface. However, in the absence of those plants and their root systems, nutrients are washed or leached away from upper soil layers, making the land infertile for commercial crops. Also, leaching leaves behind laterite, a mineral that is derived from rocks that over time reduces soil arability while making the ground <laughs> really hard. In South America, Brazil's population is growing a little slower than the rest of the South and Central American region. Nevertheless, in just 60 years, the Portuguese-speaking behemoth will be the home of 400 million people. That's about 60 million people more that's, that's living in the United States today. Its per capita GDP is less than $10,000 per year, so poverty is widespread. If there's a bright spot for Brazil, it's in its education system. 90% of the population is literate. Populations in other South American countries, like Ecuador and Paraguay, are growing much faster than Brazil. While Chile is not as developed as the United States or Canada, the earthquake-prone country boasts a 96.5% literacy rate and nearly $14,000 per GDP. However, much of the country is a dry desert, the Anaconda Desert. So nearly uh, 33 uh, million people who live there will, in 2090, have to rely on heavily on technology to survive. Let's talk about the fatal attraction of North America. The issues of human adaptation and survival have been central themes of my research over the years. Indeed, the spread of humanity around the globe was produced by the need to, to uh, need for space to bag game and gather edibles under conditions of less competition and perhaps even freedom. Freedom from those who controlled your, your uh, tribe or your, your little village. This was especially true for hunters and gatherers that bequeathed their genes and accumulated knowledge to us. Few people today, however, are hunters and gatherers, but the Americas still attract people from around the world. They are especially drawn to the labor markets and social net system of North America. In the United States, the number of foreign-born Americans topped 33 million in the year 2002, which was more than 11% of the country's population. In 2008, the U.S. Census Bureau reported that the number of foreign-born Americans had risen to 38.5 million, or about 12.5% of the country's 307 million people. By January 2025, this year, the country was the home of 340 million people, and of that number, the Center for Immigration Studies estimated that 53.5 million people in the United States were born in other countries. You might note that some 52% of the foreign-born population immigrated from other parts of the Americas, but 48% didn't. Africa, Asia, and to some extent Eastern Europe, but not a lot from Western Europe. This is the equivalent of all the citizens of the Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, Costa Rica, Guyana, Jamaica, Nicaragua, and Panama pulling up stakes and moving to the United States of America. Hmm. It's important to look at the environmental situations in those states that are attracting immigrants from other countries in the Americas. Texas, California, and Florida, as well as the relatively safe environs in New York are magnets for international folk. With the exception of New York, which will not be out of harm's way when or if an ice age returns, each of those states presents a number of human environmental hazards that will only worsen if population densities in them increase. While much attention is given to the San Andreas Fault zone in California, few people outside the seismologist community know that the main fault zone actually has a, a number of branch faults. The Hayward Fault, it extends through the East Bay region of San Francisco. At almost 17,000 people per square mile, the city already has a population density that's twice as high as Los Angeles. Seismologists estimate that a release of pressure along the Hayward, or Hayward uh, Fault will generate a quake in the range of 7.0 on the Richter scale. Not all quakes generate the same kind of seismic waves and hence damage got to keep that in mind. If the tectonic event were to occur along the San Andreas Fault, about 31 miles north of downtown area of Los Angeles, the release of energy would be enormous, and so would the resulting damage to infrastructure. The loss of life would be widespread and catastrophic. 
Although states located along the Mississippi and Ohio rivers are not magnets for huge numbers of immigrants from the Americas, they make up a region in which the domestic population will continue to grow. The New Madrid Fault underlies a portion of the Mississippi River. In the event of another quake in the magnitude of those of 1811 and 1812, which I did a couple of videos on, the loss of life near the fault would be large. While the population density of Louisville, Kentucky uh, closely matches that of Los Angeles, the current densities of Memphis and St. Louis are mercifully much less. There are, however, cities in the damage zone that weren't there in 1811 and 1812. There may have been settlements there, but they weren't cities. Cape Girardeau, Missouri, Paducah, Kentucky, Jonesboro, Arkansas, and other communities like Shaw, Mississippi, and Benoit, Mississippi, where I used to live, I used to live in Shaw, actually, worked in Cleveland, uh, that lie outside the boundaries of the major cities and bring the population in the hazard zone to nearly two million folks. Given that builders in California are more aware of the need to erect flexible structures than their counterparts in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys, damage in California is likely to be less than along the Mississippi and its major tributary. Based on their impacts on local landscapes, it should be pointed out that quakes of 1811-1812 produced vertical and horizontal energy waves. Structural designs that can absorb those kinds of shaking are expensive. Memphis, St. Louis, and Louisville are cities in which large numbers of poor people live in brick and mortar-based housing developments. Those brittle structures may well be death traps for hundreds of thousands of Americans. Gulf Coast states are vulnerable to destructive hurricanes. As development continues along the portion of that portion of the American coastline, investments and lives will be at stake. Again, it's not a question of whether a Category 5 hurricane will make landfall, it's rather a question of when and where along the coast it will occur. Cities of Florida like Miami, Tampa, and Halea are magnets to retirees from the north. Most of these transplanted folk do not have any family members living nearby, so in the event of a powerful hurricane, they depend on government agencies to find refuge from high winds, torrential rain, and storm surge, a hurricane's most lethal weapon. The Great Plains, too, are dangerous places for people, especially those who are not highly mobile. This part of the country is attractive to immigrants from Latin America because without advanced education or specialized training, they can find work on ranches and farms and other forms of agribusiness. Unfortunately for them, a lack of local knowledge of weather events could place them in jeopardy. Poverty makes it difficult for residents to live in the safest homes. Subsidized housing usually takes the form of brick and mortar structures. If they're able to find residences outside of the housing developments, they typically live in mobile homes or cheaply built frame houses. Neither of these types of structures stands much of a chance against an F4, let alone an F5 tornado. In the event that the community in which they live has a public storm shelter, not having adequate English language skills, as well as a reliable transportation, limits them and their ability to learn about them and then uh, and to seek refuge in the event of a major storm event. At the end of the day, we have to rethink policies aimed at attracting and discouraging immigrants. There are just too many leaders in America, and I use that label rather loosely, with short-sighted goals to bring in cheap labor or a new constituent base for a rising tide of socialists. Not only are we experiencing the density of human population in environmentally dangerous places, but we're also bringing in too many people who will not assimilate into the cultural fabric of America. This is a morally bankrupt idea, and one that should be abandoned sooner rather than later. The more diverse a population is, the more difficult it is find, to find ideas and values in which we can all agree and pull together. Those are called centripetal social forces. In fact, there are more centrifugal social forces than there, than there are centripetal social forces. Well, anyway, that's all I have for you today, folks. I appreciate you joining me, and uh, God bless you and yours. See you later. Bye-bye.